Anselm Bible family and good morning Facebook friends and what a glorious December 26th what a glorious after Christmas day morning that we are enjoying this morning all because of his grace and his mercy we're happy that you're here today and uh, we will dive into his scriptures we do ask and well, well, well we do beg your your forgiveness for the slightly later hour today we've had technical difficulties we've had uh, 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 a system update that was uh, out of nowhere this morning. So we think we're caught up and let's go to our Father in prayer. Father, we thank you this morning again for being so merciful this morning, for seeing fit in all of your perfect wisdom to extend us just a little while longer. Each and every one of us that are here and I mean here in so many different places, we're ever so thankful that, that we have this time, that we have this time together, and that we have this time with you in your blessed word. Teach us well, feed us well this morning. Amen. Christians fully equipped. Christians fully equipped. Again, we thank you for being here, and we're in this holiday season, if you would, we know that December 25th is just a day that man has set aside. We know that it may have some origins uh, that are quite unseemly, but we do not celebrate a day. We do not celebrate all of the accessories that go along with it. We lift up and honor the Father and we celebrate the King. So we thank our Father in heaven and we worship our King, Jesus and we are ever so thankful for God's perfect plan of redemption through the birth of Christ. By that name we are called Christians and we need be, as the title suggests, fully equipped. We're going to talk about the, the, the story of Apollos today and its story may be somewhat familiar to you but we're still going to uh, get into all of the uh, uh, the Acts 18 account of him. There are any number of accounts of Apollos in scriptures. There's several, um, but from those accounts, from those accounts, we we don't glean any much much extra information, if you will. But from the Acts 18 account, you might say that there's no additional information or not much additional information about the man. But from this text, we do get a pretty clear picture of who he was. We do get a, a very clear picture of his of, of, of his ethic, if you would. And it gives us a pretty good account of the man. And from that account, I believe this morning that we can, as Christians, take a lesson. Let's do so. Acts 18, verse 24 through 28. Now a certain man named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside. They took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Verse 27, And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those 
who had be, who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. How very appropriate again, still celebrating this uh, through this holiday season, if you would, if you would, Christ Jesus. We have Apollos who was his faith, his passions, his ethics were centered upon Jesus the Christ. He was a certain man named Apollos. He was a Jew. It describes him, briefly if you would, but a healthy description. His, you might say, character, his it, it preceded him. You knew who he was because of the testimony of those who knew him, because of the work that was renowned in the area with which he worked. Calls him this diligent man working for the kingdom with his current complement of gifts. So here we have a diligent man working for the kingdom with his current complement of gifts. With that, before we look into Apollos, think about yourselves. Can we be called diligent? Does our, like Apollos, reputation precede us? And what is that reputation? When people talk about you, what do they talk about? When people maybe discussing you. You ever thought about that? It's like, I wonder what people say about me if and when they discuss me. Right. What, what do they say? What am I known for in the minds of those that may know me? Apollos, again, his reputation precedes him. And though we don't have a great deal of extra information aside from the text, here we have a human being who actually lived, and here is an account of him, scriptural account, which of course is just good enough, not good enough, it's just fine for the Christian, because we know that the scriptures are inerrant. We know that the scriptures we can trust. What does inerrant mean? Without error. Without error, right? They are without error, and of course a, a deeper theological study will let us know that the closer we get to the original manuscripts, they are indeed inerrant. That is a healthy, necessary point of good theology, of good biblical theology, that God's writ, these Gospels, not just the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, but the entire Gospel, the text, the book, the Bible, is inerrant. The older it gets, the closer that we get to the original manuscripts the original writs. That said, Apollos has a description here. His qualifications confirmed his call to ministry. Now a certain man named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in scriptures. Well, he was born in a city called Alexandria. Who do we know with that name from history? Alexander. Alexander the Great. This is a celebrated city in Egypt, and it was built by Alexander and the Great, of course, for whom it was named. Was seated on the Mediterranean Sea between Lake Mariatis and the beautiful harbor formed by the island, uh, an island called Pharos, and it was 12 uh, miles west of a place uh, called the Canopic branch of the Nile River. Under the direction of a man named Denocrates, celebrated architect, this Denocrates also was the architect of the Temple of Diana at Ephesus, uh, excuse me, at Ephesus. And we know of this temple because it was the location of oh so many uh, uh, horrific um, acts. Uh, sexual acts 
that were committed under the guise of worship to the goddess Diana. The city also was known for its schools. It was a place where you could receive education. Needless to say, it's a pretty good educated guess that our study here today, that Apollos was likely educated in some part in this great city of Alexandria. A Jew born in Alexandria and called an elo eloquent man. Don't you want to be, no matter your origin, also, no matter where you were born, this is the beauty of scripture. This is the power of our God in heaven to transform us no matter our origin. Now, of course, he was at a place where you could be educated in any number of things. An eloquent man, mighty in scriptures. It doesn't say that he was known for all of the, ah, all, all of the horrific occurrences that might, might have occurred at Alexandria or any other place. What's his reputation? His reputation is mighty in scriptures. And then he came to Ephesus. His qualifications confirmed his call to ministry. We see what is clearly a positive description of this believer, of this Christian, who is definitely, though, lacking and not yet fully equipped. There's a, there's a thought, of course, in theology, in our theology, that God uses broken vessels, right? Mm -hmm. Or imperfect persons. Yep. Well, he created us. He knows what we are. He knows who we are. And he knows who we are right now. Mm -hmm. He knows where you came from. He knows where you're going. He knows right where you're at to use incorrect grammar. He knows where you are, right? He does. He knows where Apollos is. And in his text, he describes Apollos being born in Ale Alexandria, eloquent in speech and mighty in scriptures. An eloquent man. An eloquent man who's not fully equipped. So we have this positive description of this believer but yet, far from finished. Far from finished. We like to use the saying, God ain't through with me yet. Now, a lot of times, we like to say that after we have put on a display that is uh, decidedly ungodly. Well, y'all don't have to forgive me because God ain't finished me. So in some way, blaming God for him being a little slow. For him being a little slow on his completing, on his uh, I, completing my... We have a little technical difficulty. Let's correct it quickly. Here we go. Hopefully we're still with you. I don't know if it actually broke stream, but there was something interrupting our screen here. We have this eloquent man. And eloquent in the Greek means he was fluent as an orator. Fluent as an orator, Rachel. That he was fluent as an orator. I still hope we're with you. We have our we have our bit defender here. What keeps us free from all of the malware. Go up just a bit. The arrow was just under the X. There we go. Again, forgive me, and I hope it doesn't continue to happen. Uh, just sit tight and watch for my cue. So we have this eloquent man in the Greek. That means fluent as an orator. He was well-spoken. The man knew how to talk. He was well-spoken. Already well-equipped to speak. God is nothing, is he not, if he's not practical? God is nothing if he is not practical. An effective minister should be a gifted communicator, some way, somehow. Now, that doesn't mean he has to have the most mellifluous voice. He doesn't have to be able to uh, uh, sound and have these rosy, smooth tones 
to his voice. There may be some voices that don't quite, you know, are, aren't quite so pleasant to listen to for particular periods of time. There's any number of my favorite ministers as well uh, for, 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 for even my childhood. My dad would pull up in the car, pick us up from the bus stop, and he would be playing any number of orators that, again, voice-wise, maybe not the most pleasant, maybe not so. Uh, who, who's the one we know of? It's uh, J. Vernon McGee. Thank you, right? He's got this old country sharp tone to his voice. And and but the the passion with which, but the intensity with which, but the oh my goodness, but the the, the doctrinal accuracy. accuracy, thank you, that he has put into the text, then all of a sudden you you find yourself you're listening to the words of God. Mm -hmm. You're listening to the text. And again, all of that surface stuff, you don't hear anymore if it's not so, oh, pleasant or to your ears. Because by man's standards, by man's standards, he may not have the greatest, smoothest, most wonderful voice to listen to for an extended period of time. In college, I had any number of professors that were absolutely, oh my gosh, do not take that guy at eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> do not take her course at, you know, late in the day when, you know, your day is long because, again, she's very, very, very difficult to listen to. But again, when you take into account the content and what they've poured into it, you can't not listen. An eloquent man here, Apollos effective minister, gifted in communication. And though being eloquent doesn't mean that anybody else in particular is called to preach. Of course, that's kind of what we do very often in many of our churches. Mm -hmm. If you have the gifted speaker, and of course, if you can speak and sing, then obviously you were called to preach. <laughs> right? Because yeah. if you can yeah. sing, oh my Lord. Again, especially in our communities, especially oftentimes we have it backwards. We, were, we will place a very young man who has not fulfilled any of the standards required by the text in a position of ministry and the pastorate even, mm -hmm. just because he's goodly to look upon, right. because he can sing, mm -hmm. and because he's fluent in speech. Those things do not mean that you are called to preach by any means, mm -hmm. by any means. I was the short talk man. I was the short talk guy yeah. um, as, I, as, as I grew up in church and repeatedly was told that that voice called to preach. Well, my daddy was a preacher too. Oh my goodness, that's, that's the other thing, right? Okay, well, his daddy was a preacher, then he obviously should be called to preach. And he can do a nice short talk, of course, based on the ability to speak, then you're called to preach. Based on your pedigree, then you may be called to preach. Not so. Not so. Your calling comes directly from God. I remember and tell my wife all the time, and I know I've spoken it from behind the pulpit. I can remember being 25 years old in our new apartment and shaving and saying, I wonder if, if I will assume or if I will accept the call anytime soon. I knew that I was called and I knew that it had very little to do with an ability to put together a brief thesis or do a short talk. It was a calling within my heart from God. I don't know how better to explain it. And it was quite clear. And, and, and you can't be talked out of it when it's correct. So not based on the ability to speak or that, that, that didn't make him the preacher that he was. Well, he was the preacher that he was, but still not yet fully equipped. We create preachers from those who we like to listen to, who have the prettiest smile, able to sing, rather than to rate, wait for God's choice. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. you think about the story of the Israelites. Why did Israel choose or who did Israel choose 
rather than to wait for God's choice as their earthly king. Absolutely. Turn to 1 Samuel. Turn to 1 Samuel. I'm going to turn there too. We got 1 Samuel and we're going to go to 1 Samuel 8. So the book is 1 Samuel. The chapter is 8. The verse, we'll begin at verse 4. So 1 Samuel chapter 8 and the verse is 4. And my pages are being very unruly. <laughs> Here we go. 1 Samuel 8th chapter, and we're going to start at verse 4. It says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. Samuel is he who was called uh, to speak for God to them. The prophet, he was, he, was, he was there to speak to the people. He was the go-between. He was the priest there that was charged to give God's messages to God's people. Then Samuel at Ramah and said to them, Look, this is what they're saying to Samuel, You are old, and your son sons do not walk in their ways. Basically, they're acknowledging, uh, Your sons ain't called to do what you was called to do. Amen. Now, make us a king to judge us like all nations. That's what they said. So let's skip on down to verse 13, just to save a little time. So, after they demanded their king, this is what Samuel told them. Let's skip to verse 10 really quickly. So Samuel told all uh, the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. Now skip to 13. Now this king that he's saying, this king that you're asking for or demanding rather than waiting on God's choice, he will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers, so literally to be at his beck and call. Verse 14, And he will take the best of your fields, and your vineyards, and your olive groves, and give them to his servants. So all your hard-earned labor that you've worked and you've earned, he's saying, well, he's going to take that to benefit those that he wants to be benefited. Skip down to verse 18. Well, we'll continue reading. Verse 16, he will take your male servants, your female servants, your finest young men, and your donkeys, and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your sheep, and you will be his servants. This is the king that you're demanding. And you will cry out in that day because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Verse 19, nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, no, but we will have a king for us, so that over us, that we also may be like all nations, and that our king may judge us, and go out before us, and fight our battle. They're saying, ah, we expect that of the king. I guess that, that may happen, that may not happen. We just want to be like everybody else. Saints, if you are mimicking yourself after the world, then we have missed the mark. Look all around you. Look at the culture and the climate that we exist in today. Our standards cannot be, must not be mimicking that of the culture with which we live in. It should be so separate. How many times have we said, if you place our family, the Christian family, and we hold it juxtaposed next to the world's families, they should not act the same, talk the same, be the same. Our church, the church of God, cannot mimic that of the world in any way, shape, or form. It's one of the things just a, a doctrinal point or a point of polity within the church. It's one of the reasons that congregational rule is problematic. The scriptures clearly say in Hebrews and other places that the godly men were set above the congregation to make the godly decisions that are necessary. Any number of us may know people who are not spiritually inclined, who may be 
surface when it comes to their understanding. They may be saved, but their understanding may not be deep enough mm -hmm. to have those particular spiritual considerations that they need to have a one for one. We get caught up in that because especially our churches because we live in America. Mm -hmm. And America is this democratic society where one man has one vote. Not so in the church. It shouldn't be that way because they're in, in any larger group of people, oh, larger group, any group of people, large or small, there are going to be those who are not spiritually inclined. They may be saved but they do not need to have, they don't understand the text of scripture like they should. They don't have uh, spiritual considerations. They can only look only so deep and even after significant study and teaching still may not be qualified. That doesn't mean you don't love them or that they are less than in any way. It is simply not their role. They may be service oriented. They may be uh, 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 equipped to worship uh, uh, to the worship service and uh, to service literally during worship and to the body of believers in any other way. They may be incredible singers, yeah. whatever their gift may be. Here we have a gifted man who is a gifted orator and he is indeed called to preach. So he should have those spiritual considerations because he's uh, attempting to decipher the text of scripture. However, there are those who may not be there. And they should not have a vote on the spiritual matters because theirs is not discerning enough. So again, one of the troubles with congregational rule churches is just that. If everybody, then it simply means, well, I may be from a family who is not particularly deep in scripture, but we got, you know, several generations there and we, we have half of the <laughs> congregation related to us. That means, okay, we're going to win every vote. Yeah even though we may not be spiritually inclined. The question for us today, all Christians, is as we take inventory of our talents, do they confirm our call? What are your talents? And that doesn't mean it's always the case, especially whatever, uh, wherever you are at any particular time. Just because you are skilled or talented in a certain way, you may not be called to serve the church in that way. However, however you are called, you should be able to either exercise that ability, not necessarily naturally, you may have to acquire, you may have to acquire that skill. One of the things that, that when I say that skill, maybe you are not naturally service oriented, but you see, or you have a heart or this growing passion in you. And again, then suddenly you do want to serve the body of believers in a quiet way in the background because you don't like the limelight. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's who I am naturally. So tell me any way that I can serve, but I do not need any, do not want any kind of front man status. That's a beautiful disposition to have because it's a humble one. You may be hospitality oriented mm -hmm. and just want to literally serve people, whether it is handing them out all of the uh, items that you need, maybe, maybe, maybe an usher or maybe in the hospitality committee or maybe just to serve the other auxiliaries as a service person. And if you are a deacon in the church, if you are a minister in the church, then you would be... It would behoove you to get used to servants. Question again, does your confirmation, excuse me, do your talents confirm your call, whether natural or to be acquired? If you're not involved in any ministry in the body, then take inventory of your talents and petition God for his direction. You know what? I do want to serve, but I don't know where. So, Lord, this is what I like to do. Is there a way that I can do that for your people? Think about those things. Think about them deeply and sincerely and petition God and he will answer your prayers. Once confirmed, again, ask how can I serve the local body or the larger body? Recently joining the Long Beach Harbor Southern Baptist association that's a larger body and there are several people any number of people that serve in this larger body this conglomerate of churches and they have title and position there um and again so they're serving a larger body or in your smaller body in your local church 
one way, any, uh, excuse me, one way or the other, somehow, some way, you will be confirmed by God to serve his people. Just one way or the other. Apollos was serving the body as mentioned approximately 10 times in scripture, this Apollos, uh, all in the context of an effective Christian. Most familiar, familiarly, <laughs> first my tongue was tied, 1 Corinthians 1 and 12. Turn there for us quickly. 1 Corinthians, the chapter is 1 and the verse is 12. 1 Corinthians 1 and 12. So here we have Paul, of course, writing to the church at Corinth. And of course, this is in the uh, uh, just after the opening of his letter, and he's dealing with this church at Corinth. And of course, Corinth had some particular problems. So here we have a mention of our subject, Apollos, today. Now I say this, Paul saying to the church, that each of you says Paul was dealing with their clickishness. Mm -hmm. So Paul here is saying, this is who you are and this is what you are known for. There's, there's any number of other occurrences in Scripture where Paul's writing to a, another church or group of believers and he says you're known for things that are wonderful and positive and we know who you are because, who, because you're some praying folks or because you're some passionate folks or because you're some wonderfully diligent and study type folks here for the Corinthians. He says, now I say this, each of you says, this is what you guys are known for. I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, there's our subject, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided, Paul is saying? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? You got it so twisted because your focus is on who you see as elevated, or eloquent, or someone who you think should be the front man here. So much so that you miss the mark to the degree that you are placing Christ himself in the same category as mere men. You actually include Christ in your divvying up of human distinctions. If you haven't, if, 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 if this is who you are, then you have indeed missed the mark. But here we have this mention of Apollos here amongst Paul. And Paul says, I'm even included in your list. And Paul says, how, how, how wrong is that? I know who I am. I know I am fallible. I know. Paul says, oh, by the way, have, have you Corinthians read, read, read my seventh chapter of Romans? If not, wait for it, right? He's saying, me, Paul, I'm always doing what I'm not supposed to do. And that thing that I'm not supposed to do, I am always doing. And the thing that I should be doing, I'm not doing. He's saying, and you're naming me amongst your list? By the way, that includes the Messiah, who should not be on any list of mere men. And he also says, if he goes on to say, or oh, were you baptized in the name of Paul? Or did Paul crucify you? He says, I'm not qualified to be on a list with Christ. And no man is qualified to be on that list. Christ should be preeminent in your minds. And you all should be, I am of Christ. Mm -hmm. That's the implication there. Mm -hmm. This is not a commentary on Apollos' divisiveness. Oh, not at all. This is a commentary on the Corinthians, but a commentary on the Corinthian church showing the partiality amongst their, what they would consider their effective teachers. Go to the story of a man who refused to bury his talents. Matthew 25. Matthew, 25th chapter, and the 21st verse. Matthew 25, the verses 24 and 25. Matthew 25, verse 24. And we'll read Matthew 25, verses 24 and 25. So he says here, this is the parable of the talents, and the master had left several of his 
uh, servants with talents and told them to go multiply them. And, excuse me, verse 25, 24, then he who had received, when he is taking inventory, then he who had received the one talent, and a talent is a non-specific sum of money or a coin, is simply what he's saying. I've given you all a sum of money, and he says, go do what you will to multiply my money. So then he came to take inventory, and he said, the one that received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown. Why would you tell your master who you are indebted to that they are unruly, unreasonable, and a hard man? Reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. Verse 25, and I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. Ooh, ooh, this servant, number one, he just ain't too bright, right? He's almost challenging or he's challenging his master for giving him the talent and making him do something with it to which he has done nothing except for bury it. Saints, don't bury your talents. Especially if they can be used for the edification, advancement, service to the body of believers. One, of, one, one ability that we ha all have is indeed servants. Whatever ability your body has, even those who may be more feeble, one of the most blessed things in the world is to see someone who continues in service to, despite physical ailments. Now there may be, may be time where, you know, those in leadership may say, hey, well, no, we, we need to make sure that we're not exasperating your condition. And you can certainly worship and serve, actually, in some other way. And God will bless uh, in some other way. Either he'll give us some equipment that we need so that that person can continue in service. Or we can find another role and responsibility that that person would be satisfied uh, uh, and, 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 and feel and know that he is still or she is still worshiping and serving God despite any number of physical ailments. Don't bury your talent, though. This man, not exercising his gifts for the kingdom, is clearly characterized someone who's not truly or not really a servant of his master anyway. And it's evidenced by his description because earlier, master calls him a criminal. What is it that you do? And do we do it for the glory of God? Is your gift on display for the kingdom, or are your talents buried? We do have to consider those things. Especially, we've prayed and continue to pray for a place of worship, especially during this new and uh, 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 phase of the COVID, all of the repercussions that come with it of COVID-19, and we're completing the necessary steps so that we could take advantage of some of the um, some of the advantages that the Long Beach Harbor Association uh, should afford us as far as that conglomerate of churches and there should be hopefully very soon a place of worship uh, because there's so many buildings that may not be in use. Of course, we will consider our elderly. We will consider those who well, and at least the the, the public. Um, the public instruction to, 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 to temper our worship and to do those things that are necessary so we can do our part to quell the spread of the disease, even if we are allowed to, hopefully very soon, to reunite and meet again. What is it that you do? Do you do it for him? And are your talents on display? And again, it may not be any particular talent. It may be a general one. But whatever, wherever you are charged to work, do so with great passion. That's the thing that we see here. Even though Apollos, and we'll touch upon it in greater detail a little bit later, we see Apollos here, and we see that he was taken aside by a couple and taught more accurately. The thing that we see is no matter where he lacked in equipment or equipping, his disposition was a correct one. His, his, his passion, his willingness, his humility was so great 
that it was not above him to be taught. He was not the unruly. He was not, uh, not, not one who was incorrigible. He was not caught up in himself. He was willing to learn, even though it says this is an eloquent man, educated and accurately teaching the way of Christ. Let's continue. He was a man known for his strength in the word. Says he was mighty in scriptures, his reputation preceded him. He was the guy you went to in his town when there was a troublesome text or when you wanted to be taught with some kind of accuracy on a point. You knew that he was educated, very likely, very likely he, he, he instructed or he certainly most, more than likely encouraged many to be educated. Always, there's always those who are calling the pastor, if you would, for a question or spiritual guidance. And again, the pastor should be able to answer any number of questions and the questions that he cannot answer, he should be able to decipher and, and, and determine and go find. Uh, however, there's also the responsibility of the believer to be able to to be able to discover those things for themselves, especially considering the tools that we have available to us these days. Now, sometimes you may not have the insight and uh, those in spiritual leadership should be able to provide that. But of course, they should also instruct you. They should also encourage you to acquire the skills, to acquire the abilities, even the talent, if you will, to discover those things on your own. It is of most it, 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 eminently important for the leadership in the church <clears throat> to encourage the body of believers to know him for yourself and know the scriptures for yourself. You will hear it repeated throughout our fellowship. Have a working knowledge of scripture, coined by Brother Greg, of course. A working knowledge of scripture. You know how you should be able to know how to pick up the Bible and you don't have to a parolee as, as we had a, a great discussion the other day and he is going through crisis and he told me and he says well you're supposed to know the Bible because I guess he heard and you know we've had a discussion here or there and I said well no what that says here and what that says there means this in brief I said let's not get caught up in that because again I'm not supposed to be at our, our, our or at my job trying to proselytize he brought it up I said well we can stay there if you'd like so, and he said, so when I repeated and corrected what he said, he said, well, I, I, you have to find that on your phone. You don't know it uh, by memory. And it's, it's that, <laughs> the ego you have to put in check. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, mm -hmm. no, that's not the standard. Nowhere in scripture does it say you have to memorize the whole of scripture. Right. Are you kidding? There will be those scriptures. Some people just have a great memory. God bless them. And you should try to develop those things. A lot of times those things just develop as you have more familiar, familiarity with the scriptures. My father was pretty good at memorizing scripture. But of course, so much of that was because he had been a preacher and a pastor for decades. Mm -hmm. And that simply comes from where you spend your time in the text of scripture. I now remember things and it's kind of like, oh yeah, that comes from here or there. Mm -hmm. Let me find it for you. And of course, there's no excuse though nowadays because you can simply punch in the key. I always say I have a King James Rolodex in my head. Now, it may not be for every scripture, but I have the key terms filed away. So you punch up the key terms. You find it in the King James. I go cr cross-reference through usually through a new King James or want to end up in an NASB, New American Standard Version, because we, we, we usually teach as that uh, as, as a pretty high standard of the, again, going all the way back to one of the former points that we made in this episode being uh, one of the man one of the uh, transliterations that has that comes from the earliest manuscripts so the NASB is usually where where we want to start from however there are times that the descriptive aspect of the other translations simply fit and 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 make the point just a little bit better let's continue so Genuine, the genuine need for counseling or 
an argument that you may not be able to finish, yes, yeah, sure, go to your spiritual leadership and say, you know what, I was studying this, can you help me up on this point of doctrine? So the fully equipped pastor should be able to discern such motives because there are those sometimes whose motives may be slightly less than godly when they ask you a question. When I was taught, I was taught certainly that that is a skill or that that is a point of discernment or wisdom that needs to be understood by those in spiritual leadership. There will be those who come to you and do not have godly motives. Mm -hmm. They went to Christ all the time, right? And they ask him loaded questions, yeah. waiting for the answer. And there's an example that we may use a little bit later when they ask him and he says, well, yeah, I'm, I'm from the beginning. I, I am the I am. They said, oh, we got it. Yeah. And they picked up the stones. Counseling, Christians. I've, I've done some counseling of uh, 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 a few couples. The men in particular would charge them for their responsibility. Oftentimes those men were disobedient to the text. Mm -hmm. And again, you don't listen to a couple's problems after they usually come to you and say we would like counseling and just begin to point fingers. One of the first things, it's like before, before we begin, no one understand that it's God's and my sincere belief that you can, that you must submit yourself to the text, to the scriptures. And I trust, hope, and believe that that's why you're coming so that we can find out what thus said the Lord. What old folks used to say, right? That why we go to church. Why? So we can find out what thus said the Lord. So when it comes to your marriage or that relationship that God has put together, that, that, that biblical marriage, I hope that, again, if you are searching and looking for counseling, that you're looking for the biblical answer. And that when you get it, and it tells you that you have a responsibility that you're not meeting, that you begin to, and your passion should be, uh, uh, that drive to want to begin to meet that, to put that thing back together. Whether it be your wife of 28 years, 8 years, or 8 days. Whether it has to do with children or finance or, or mentoring or whatever it is. Especially for men who are leading the family. We need to know how to get the meaning of the text. It may be a simpler text. So we know how, need to know how to pray and ask God for guidance. It may be a harder text. It may require hermeneutics and exegesis and more formal study. And you do have a responsibility, especially in the leading and guiding of a family. Absolutely. Especially in today's times when they are not going to get that kind of teaching, instruction, prodding, prodding, or even that kind of uh, 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 the, the Bible or any notion about it is going to be included in any kind of public discussion. As men and women, as fathers and mothers, we need to be on the same page and encourage not just one another, but our children as well, that again, we live according to the text of Scripture. And how can we do so? We don't know what it means. Mm -hmm. We need to know how to finish. There were, any, as, as, as we were studying my theological education any number of times, and uh, our class was one of the initial classes that the pastor was teaching, and the classes that followed, they didn't turn in their midterm, and we're like, wait a minute, no. you got to turn in your midterm. Well, no, we just kind of, and we were just, the people in the first class were like, wait, no, that can't happen. And after I began to just just, just encourage those, no, you, this has to be, we were excited about it. Some of the things changed, of course, as church congregations always do. Mm -hmm. Turn to, well, actually, go well, just moving on down to, Verse 25, where it says, of our text, this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord. It means that he'd been taught either formally or by other ministers, or the scriptures, of course, 
or certainly all of those things considered, and now he's an effective Bible teacher. That's what Apollos was. And it's the, the, the point is that he sat down and submitted himself as a student to someone who taught him, and particularly it says what? The way of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And in particular, uh, as it pertained to Christ, meaning he was correctly trained, particularly in the Old Testament scriptures, those were the ones that were written, with respect to the Messiah. With respect to the Messiah. He didn't have the whole of scriptures correctly, but he knew that part and he knew that part well. That's good. That's, that's a great place to start, is it not? Yeah. Salvation comes through who? Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. So, if I'm going to know something, that's a pretty good thing to know. Because if somebody comes to you, especially if you have title and position amongst the body of believers, you need to know how to instruct on that kind of saving grace. Well, you can't get that through nobody else except Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus. It says that he was skilled, of course, in the way of the Lord. He was skilled according to the gospel, according to Christ. Salvation comes through Christ. And if you do not have a correct view or understanding of who Christ is, then your ability to witness or evangelize will be incomplete. He had that part. That's a good part to have. And again, if that means that he was skilled or if he was aware of the Old Testament texts that were certainly available to him, being in his title and position and his, his, his education, turn to the book of Isaiah, and it's so appropriate because, of course, we're talking about the Christ child that Chris, Christians are, of course, during this season. So Isaiah 7, just get a couple of Old Testament examples. Old Testament mentions. So these were the things that Apollos very likely was skilled upon and was able to, to teach and preach upon. And when he was in the synagogue, and he says he taught accurately according to the Lord, according to Christ Jesus, it may say in your translation. Isaiah 7 and 14, I'm sorry if I didn't give you the whole biblical address. Isaiah 7 chapter Verse 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. This is Old Testament. This is centuries before. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child. Think of hundreds of years before. A virgin will be with child and bear a son. And she will call his name Emmanuel. Just one mention of Old Testament mention of Christ. Turn to Psalms 22. Hold your finger in Isaiah because we're going to go back to Isaiah 53. But right now to Psalms 22. Considering that Apollos was a man of education. Here's a great point. Psalms 22 and 1 says this. Now this is the psalmist saying, this is the person who wrote the psalm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So the psalmist in Psalms 22 and 1 says again, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Now the psalmist is crying out to God here. But is he foreshadowing, if you would, the words of Christ on the cross from Matthew 27 and 46? If you want to, just listen. You know this text. So when Christ is on the cross, so we go from Christ's birth in Isaiah 7 and 14, where it says the virgin uh, will be with child and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. And in the study of Christ in the Old Testament, we're certainly going to come across this Psalms 22 because these words are so preeminent mm -hmm. in the story of Christ. 
is, is the psalmist crying out here or foreshadowing Christ's words, those words in Matthew 27 and 46 say, verse 46, about the ninth hour, because it says, of course, it was dark between the sixth and the ninth, right? Uh, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, 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 yama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, you can't say from Psalms 22, where the psalmist is saying it, and Christ is saying it in Matthew 27 and 46, excuse me, where Christ is saying it, yes, in Matthew 27 and 46, you cannot say dogmatically that the psalmist is foreshadowing or prophesying, if you would, the words of Christ. Barnes says this, it must be admitted that this circumstance is not conclusive proof of such a design, since he might have used these words having originally uh, another reference. In other words, they may have originated in another place or time as best fitted to express his own sufferings. He's saying again, this may have been a more common phrase than we realize. That he and Christ uttered in the midst of suffering. Okay, that's a fair point. We know that it's the same, but in the study of Christ in the Old Testament, you're certainly going to want to want to do some study. Oh, well, let, let's find out who this psalmist is. Let's figure out, you know, if and when. Now, whether or not it was from... Uh, uh, it was more common in the culture, whether or not Christ was saying it uh, because it was a phrase that would have been uttered during suffering, or maybe it was common, or maybe not so much. The point is that, okay, this is probably not the strongest, but it is something notable. Go back to Isaiah 53. We're going to read 4 through 9. You can read from the first verse if you'd like, but we're going to start at verse 4. So Isaiah 53, verse 4, Surely our griefs he bore himself, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Verse 5, But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. All of these he's and him's are capitalized. And by his scourging, or King James says what? By his stripes, we are healed. Verse 6, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. Big H. Verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that was led to slaughter and like a sheep that was silent before his shearers, so he did not open his mouth. Old folk used to say he did not say a mumbling word. I'm sorry. Good old storefront Baptist preacher and got that rolling over in my head time and time again. He did not open his mouth. He did not say a mumbling word. That's where that comes from. Verse 8. By, by oppression and judgment he has taken away. And as for his generation who can Considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. He's saying it was the people, it was, it was mankind that was due all of the stripes that he bore. They earned those stripes. It was their sins that he took upon his back. In verse 9, his grave was assigned with wicked men. Yet, he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. So in the Psalms 22, we can't be absolutely sure. It has no reference before. It has no reference after that say he's talking exactly about Christ and repeating, excuse me, or foreshadowing those things or prophesying in his speech, the psalmist, Psalms 22 and was the words of Christ, even though they're the same words because they could have originated from 
a more common phrase within the culture. Christ could have been repeating it as that kind of phrase. Same thing for the psalmist, but as a, in Isaiah 53, no doubt who he is or who him is that is repeated. He that took our sins. And again, centuries before the advent or the birth of Christ, this was written in Isaiah. So what a beautiful lesson, what a beautiful study, what a beautiful understanding to have correctly uh, uh, asserted in your mind that, wait a minute, in Isaiah, we have these clear notations of exactly the person uh, uh, of the Messiah. It's saying it scripture after scripture, speaking about, of course, all our sins that were placed upon his back. 1 Corinthians 3 and 11, if we take another New Testament text, thinking about Apollos and how he was, and how he was so versed in this part of the scripture. It says he was familiar, however, only with the baptism of John, and John, of course, was preaching Christ, so he was familiar with Christ. He wasn't familiar with the whole of the complete doctrine of the scriptures, so it says, 1 Corinthians 3.11, <clears throat> For no man can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. It's Christ alone. No doubt. Apollos. Apollos preached Christ and Christ alone. He may not have known all the other details or particular points of doctrine other than, but he knew Christ. And what a great thing to know. So, for so many of our families and churches, we need to begin to, where we haven't, to emphasize the need for being biblically astute. Especially in today's times. There may have been times past where those things were not so readily available. And even then it would have just taken greater work and study and time. Now, we have those things, you might say, at our fingertips. Last week, my wife and I were talking, and she was like, oh, what a great lesson on uh, Tacitus and a couple of other uh, uh, books of antiquity. Mm -hmm. And it says, wow, it's amazing how you can reference and cross-reference. You don't want to just take the first website in anything, but after you reference and cross-reference, and very often, if you have a decent uh, uh, set of books behind you, these things can be well-established in literature. Of course, of course, first and foremost, we need to be looking for those things that confirm scripture. This is a great lesson because if you are looking for Old Testament examples uh, that, that, that tell us that Christ was even mentioned in the Old Testament before his advent or birth in the New Testament and you run across Psalms 22, you might say, well, oh, there's one right there. But don't force it. Look at the text. And it's clear that well, there's no real information where this might have come from and say, but it is an allusion to whether it is specific to Christ or not, or if it has another origin. It is an allusion to the words because they are exactly what Christ said. It is an allusion to that thought or that premise. But then you go on and solidify it with the Isaiah text. You make it more firm with those things that are more sure and more foundational. So you have, we, we talked about it last week as a matter of fact, in any number of points where we talked about the two Tacitus uh, excerpts and where one may have contained interpolations over time or additions over time and is not as reliable as the first. It's just such a wonderful study. Um, of course, those are the extra-biblical sources. Here we have the sources in Scripture. So again, where our churches or our families have not emphasized the need for biblical education, we need to begin to do so and emphasize, especially in today's times where Christ is not included in the discussion. Our children need be, must be, have to be well-versed in Scriptures. We'll pick up next time. Let's bow our head in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your blessed word. We thank you for the study of your word. We thank you for the prodding as you certainly 
prophet Apollos, and he's, his story certainly provides for us this, to this day a wonderful example of the need to know you and to know your scriptures deeply. Father, and where we don't have it correctly, continue to humble us and give us those resources through the right people and, and places uh, uh, and, and things that we have at our disposal today so that we can learn correctly exactly who you are and what you would have us know. All, of course, beginning and ending with the blessed word in your scriptures. It's in your name we pray. We thank you. Amen. Amen. Saints, I trust, hope, and pray that you had or continue to have a, a, a tremendous, a wonderful, a blessed holiday season. Keep everything in perspective, though. Do not get distracted by all of the materialism that goes on with it. It's just a product of the culture. Remember, we worship and praise and honor the Father, and we certainly lift up the name of our newborn King. Join us at 7 p.m. for Bible study on Wednesday, 8 p.m. Excuse me, for prayer at 7 p.m. and 8 p.m. for Bible study. Go to AnselmBibleChurch.org. Click the gold donate button if the Lord continues to put it on your heart to support our ministry. God bless you, saints, and we will indeed see you in service in 2022. Amen.